Hey guys, and welcome to a, another video where we'll be discussing some hilarious and creative phonies or non-words that stayed on Scrabble boards. Now, our first example here is definitely more on the hilarious end of the spectrum as opposed to creative, and it features none other than Josh Sokol, who many of you may remember from some of my other videos. He's a top player well known for his creative playing of phonies. However, this phony that he played in this position was far from creative, it was completely unintentional, and what was that phony? Here, Josh plays the word when, W-H-E-N, which of course is a very common word, for 25 points. So at first you might be like, wait a minute, where's the phony here? What did he do? Well, the thing is, you have to look not only at the main word that he played, but the shorter parallel plays that he made at the same time. So if you look here on column I, he has formed the two-letter word of TH. Yes, that is right, folks. Josh has played TH. And TH is, uh, of course, not a word. And what makes this so absurd is you do occasionally see phony two-letter words in games between very strong Scrabble players. And I know that sounds bizarre at first, because, of course, all strong Scrabble players and all tournament players with really any amount of experience know their two-letter words extremely solidly. But what happens sometimes is when these players have these momentary lapses and accidentally play a phony two-order word, their opponent just takes for granted that the play won't contain any phony two-order words because they know that the person playing it knows the two-order words. So that's how you sometimes see these kind of things stay on a board. But as Josh notes in his comments here, usually they are two-order words that are at least a little bit more phonetically sound. Like, you'll see things like W-A, O-T a decent amount. I've seen A-F and L-E several times stay on the board as well. I don't think I've ever seen another two with two consecutive consonants like T-H stay on a Scrabble board before. So this is uh, definitely a first for me and uh, pretty crazy stuff. This, uh, unfortunately for his opponent Steve, uh, Steve did not notice this uh, in time. So uh, Josh had already drawn his tiles by the time Steve realized that Josh made T-H with his play. So Steve, as per the rules, was not allowed to challenge, and this absurd two-order word of TH stayed on a board in the tournament scrabble game between two experts. Now we move to another position involving Josh Sokol, but this one is far more towards the side of creativity as opposed to hilarity or absurdity. Here he's playing Michael Fagan, another top player, and he's in a very bad position. He's down 76 points, he's got two U's and two T's, and nowhere to play a bingo. So instead of fishing off a couple of tiles, like maybe trying to play off a U and a T, which would almost certainly lose after Michael simply plays down here on the bottom row, scoring a bunch of points and taking out Josh's last viable bingo line, Josh decides to bingo immediately. Now, bingo with what, you ask? He's got two U's and two T's. How the heck is he going to bingo? Well, he decides to play Nut Suit for 80 points. And this play actually accomplishes two things. Number one is if Michael, for some reason, is convinced that Nutsuit is valid, he may actually try to pluralize it next turn because this over here on the right-hand side of the board, using this triple word score as well as doubling his H on the double letter, that's actually going to score like 60 points. So it might not occur to Michael that Nutsuit is not a word. Of course, if Michael plays Hobbs for 60 points, it's going to actually score zero because Josh will very eagerly challenge it off the board and end up winning the game. Now, the second benefit for Josh is that even if Michael isn't sure that Nutsuit is valid and thus doesn't decide to risk putting an S on it, Michael may feel forced to accept the word because he knows that if he challenges Nutsuit and it's valid, Josh will be able to win the game at this point, given that Josh will be able to play out in two turns and score enough points to win. So because of that, Michael does make the decision to let Nutsuit stay on the board, and he does smartly decide to eschew pluralizing it, instead playing the word hin over here for 21 points, which does win him the game comfortably after Josh plays AA and Michael plays Boggs to go out. So it didn't quite work in the sense that it didn't win Josh the game, but it certainly saved him a lot of spread points as Michael could not reasonably challenge without being 100% sure that Nutsuit was invalid. So pretty creative stuff there from Josh. We're now going to move on to a very different player and one who we have not featured yet in any of these videos, and that is none other than Joel Sherman, who I'm guessing many of my viewers are very familiar with. He's 
uh, one of the, so, so to speak, Scrabble legends. He's been playing for many, many years, extremely strong and well-respected player and two-time North American Scrabble champion. So it goes without saying that Joel knows a lot of words, and as a result, Joel also knows a lot of non-words, including the one he played in this position of Pasanqua, P-E-S-A-N-Q-U-A. Now, his opponent is Ben Schoenbrunn, who's another extremely strong expert, and uh, I thought Ben's comment here was extremely funny and part of why I wanted to feature this. Uh, ben says, don't ask me why I didn't challenge this off. I was tired and didn't think Joel would make something like this up. Now, Joel has a, has a reputation, as I said, of an extremely strong player. He doesn't really have a reputation as someone who plays a lot of phonies. So it's understandable why uh, Ben didn't think to challenge this word. Of course, he has great respect for Joel's word knowledge and knows that Joel knows many, many obscure valid words that uh, could potentially be similar to Pasangua, but uh, Pasangua is definitely not one of them. There are a few words that slightly resemble it, such as Pysanka, P-Y-S-A-N-K-A, and Petank, P-E-T-A-N-Q-U-E. So perhaps Joel was banking on Ben thinking of those two words and maybe mixing them up in his head and thinking that Pysanka was valid. However, Pysanka is certainly not valid, and uh, this is, of course, a very costly mistake for Ben, as this scores 77 points and gets rid of Joel's Q, so if Ben were to challenge this off the board, even though Joel has the two blanks, he will still be saddled with the Q and have a little bit of a difficult path to victory, and Ben would have a fairly comfortable game. So a uh, costly mistake by Ben, but a very clever play by Joel, and that's why it's always always important to be on your toes, toes and even if you're playing a really strong player, always take everything that they play with a grain of salt, and uh, definitely do trust your word knowledge because you just never know what might be valid and what might not be. Now we move on to another position. Here we have featured uh, two very strong players, Thomas Reinke and Daryl Day, and here the person to move is Thomas. And Thomas sees several valid bingos that he can play through this O in OG, such as non-metal or unmolten on this B column. Now, the problem with these two plays from Thomas's perspective is that either of them will give back very large potential scores to Daryl on this A column using that triple word score in the middle of the board. So Thomas really doesn't want to do this. He's still uh, down points. So even though he bingos, Daryl will probably score 40 or 50 points and quickly reclaim the lead. So instead of doing that, Thomas decides to instead bingo to this EN over here on the K column with the word of Tunnelmen. Now, Tunnelmen is not a word. However, it is certainly plausible. And because it's a nine letter word, it's fairly difficult to challenge off. Most players don't really study nine letter words. so. It's, uh, it's going to be very difficult for Daryl to know for a fact that this isn't good. And uh, it's certainly reasonably plausible as, as a word. So uh, again, Thomas doesn't really gain points per se by phoning here, but he does gain a lot positionally by not giving Daryl back that huge hotspot on the A column. So uh, definitely a risk here because, of course, if Daryl challenges, then Thomas will lose his turn and Daryl will also be able to block Thomas's valid bingos on the B column. So this was definitely a big risk for Thomas, but it does pay off as Daryl does allow this to stay on the board. Now for our next example, we have another top player and uh, another player with a reputation for his creative phonies, and that is Cesar del Solar. In this position, uh, Cesar is playing another strong expert in Chris Schneider, and uh, he's got this rack here, E-E-H-L-L-R-T. And uh, he comes up with the bingo of Tree Hill through this eye. And uh, this is a fairly absurd phony. I mean, it really just doesn't make sense at all. And uh, as Cesar notes, that his best explanation he can give is that there is a show called One Tree Hill, and that caused him to be confused. Now, it is true that there is a show called One Tree Hill. However, two things. Uh, number one, proper nouns are typically not valid in, in Scrabble, uh, unless they happen to mean something else uh, aside from their definition as a proper noun. And number two, Tree Hill in the show is still two words. So it's uh, still kind of bizarre that um, the connection could be made between Tree Hill being a phrase in a TV show to being valid as a single string of letters in a Scrabble board. But, uh, but hey, you know, sometimes the brain works in funny ways. And one way or another, this uh, string of letters entered into Cesar's brain. He played it and it got by his opponent. This indeed stayed on the board as a 74-point bingo. So uh, what can you say? You just, uh, you just never know sometimes what's going to happen when two players sit across from one another and play a game of Scrabble. 
Here we have another position featuring Cesar del Solar. Here he's uh, he's playing a very strong expert who sadly passed away last year in the uh, Sal Piro. And uh, here Cesar is in a lost position. He doesn't really have any good plays. He's got a strong rack. He's got several seven letter words uh, of course, sourced, and scoured on his rack, but he doesn't have anywhere uh, he can fit them. So instead of just uh, settling for a 70 or so point loss, he decides to play Sextors from this Sexto already on the board. And this is actually a really brilliant ploy by Cesar because Sal, from his perspective, unless he's 100% sure that Sextors is not a word, cannot reasonably afford to challenge. Because if he does, then you'll see that the score is now within 19 points. So if Cesar plays out with his four tiles and then gains the 12 points from the six remaining tiles on Sal's rack, Cesar's actually going to have enough points to win this game. So Sal realizes this and smartly decides to let this stay on the board, given that he's presumably not 100% sure that this is not valid. He instead just plays Hugh over here for 12, allowing Cesar to score 15 points and play out while Sal holds on and wins the game by 8 points. Uh, now, Sextors, the closest thing I can come up with is uh, Sesters, S-E-S-T-E-R-C-E, -E -E, which I believe is an ancient Roman coin. So perhaps you could try to define Sextors as a coin worth six Sesterses or something. I don't know. Maybe that's what Cesar was thinking or, or Cesar was banking on Sal thinking. So I'm not really sure. But in any case, it is uh, most certainly not a word, but a very, very creative play and a great saver of spread here. That probably saved Cesar a good 50 or 60 spread points in this endgame. Now, the final example features uh, none other than myself. And uh, I, as uh, most of my viewers probably know, am a player who has a reputation as phonying very, very rarely. Uh, and uh, I, I do indeed not play intentional phonies very often, although I uh, very much am human and do mess up sometimes and think words are valid when they are not. And this position here is no exception. I'm playing Jeremy Hall, who is a, another very strong player who I've faced off against many times. And uh, Jeremy has opened the game with AV8. And I've got a, a rack here that's uh, it's kind of mixed. I've got some really good bingo tiles like blank ARS, but then I've got some more higher scoring and clunkier tiles like the FM and X. Now, in this position, I was entirely convinced that saxiform, S-A-X-I-F-O-R-M, was a valid word. And that's exactly what I played here for not only a bingo, but for a whopping 126-point bingo. And as I mentioned in my comment, I was literally, while Jeremy was thinking, just hoping he'd give me an I or an O, as I was so sure that saxiform was a valid word. And as soon as he put the I there... Uh, not only put the I there, but put it in a double-double line, which was literally the highest amount I could score, I very quickly and excitedly slapped this down, designating my blank as an O, and announcing 126 points for my opening play. Now, as you may guess from my tone and from the title of this video, saxiform is not a word. And uh, like I said, I was like, sure. I was actually legitimately hoping Jeremy would challenge. That's how sure I was, guys, that this was a word. And uh, I actually talked to Jeremy about this after the game. And he told me specifically that he didn't really like this. He didn't think it was a word. But the main reason that he didn't challenge was because I seemed so excited and so confident in playing it. So uh, sort of an important lesson, an interesting lesson to be learned from this position, I think, is that if you are going to phony, sometimes it's best to play it really quickly and confidently and to try to sort of feign as much confidence as you can, which is tricky to do, especially if you know something's not a word. Of course, for me, it was easier here because I thought this was a word. But this goes to show you, if you're playing something that you know isn't a word, hoping to get away with it, it may be better to play it quickly and try to act as confident as you can, as it may throw your opponent off, especially if you do have good word knowledge in general. It may throw them off into thinking you're actually playing something that you're confident is valid. And uh, this is definitely a personal record for me. This is, uh, to date, still, as of this game, it was a record, and as of today, it still stands as a record of the highest scoring phony I have ever gotten away with in a tournament Scrabble game. And uh, I know at the time it was the highest scoring phony that Jeremy had ever allowed in a tournament Scrabble game. I, uh, I'm not positive, but I believe that record still stands. If uh, Jeremy, if you're watching this video and you've allowed a phony since this game of higher than 126 points, please let me know and I will update accordingly. But uh, I believe that record still stands. But uh, in any case, uh, really, really wild stuff. Um, and again, just goes to show you, you know, uh, people like, like me, all these other top players, we have very good word knowledge, but... We all make mistakes and, uh, you know, you always always have to be on your toes and you never know what sort of uh, absurdities are going to show up on a Scrabble board like Saxiform or Pasanqua or even TH like we saw earlier. So, uh, so yeah, 
that's it for this one, guys. Some, uh, some pretty fun stuff here. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. And uh, definitely, if you know of any other games or positions where crazy or creative phonies were played, please, please do let me know, since I only know so many of these positions uh, off the top of my head, and uh, I, at some point, will run out of these positions to show you guys. So uh, if you have more, please do send them along, and I will hopefully be able to compile them into more and more of these phonies videos, because I know you guys really do enjoy them quite a lot. So thanks again for all the support, guys. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye.